join us later. Ryan Helsley will join us later. Actually, very relevant timing. And you know what? I just want to punch a little charge the mound action pretty much right from the jump here since Ken's going to join us in a sec. Very, very timely to have a former um, teammate of Jordan Hicks, a bullpen member, and someone who gets to observe Jordan Hicks now moving to the starting rotation. So uh, let's do this. Kratz, Jordan Hicks getting four years 44 million bucks. Why not try him out as a starting pitcher? Because you know what? There aren't that many legit starting pitchers in baseball anymore. And the Giants don't really care about starting pitchers. They figure, <laughs> eh, we have a bunch of bullpen guys. So I hope for Jordan Hicks's sake, he got some start some start uh, escalators put into his contract. I, I'm interested. I, just the last, I think this came out a couple minutes ago. I've just been looking at, you know, did he change some of his repertoire? Was there something different? So I want to ask Helsley. I want to ask every one of our 19 guests that we have on today. <laughs> Adam, it's tough to find starting pitching now. This has happened already this offseason. It's funny, on one of my long plane rides recently, I was reading a good article from someone about all of these relievers that he targeted that could be starters in the future. I can get into some of those if we have time at some point. We probably won't. But Reynaldo Lopez signed with the Atlanta Braves, and he's been yeah. starter, then pretty high-end reliever, and now back to starter. So what do you think of Jordan Hicks in that realm? I mean, it's, I mean, it's obviously a gamble because he hasn't started in the major leagues. He's thrown the majority of his innings, I mean, almost all of them as a relief pitcher. Um, but again, you know, if you're able in today's era, if you're able to give a good strong five, um, I think teams are, teams are happy. So, you know, that they might be going for that, but at the same time, I think it's a low risk. If he, if he doesn't work out as a starter, it's 44 million over four years. I think that, uh, if you move him back to the bullpen, back to high leverage, that's where he, I, I think is the best, best value unless hey, they know something we don't. Um, I just think he's very nasty at that bullpen and comes in and gets a, a mount, crazy amount of ground balls. Now, if he's a starter, is he going to throw 104 every pitch or is he going to uh, dumb it down to 98? <laughs> <laughs> dumb it down to 98 still still will work. Let's bring in FT Senior Insider Ken Rosenthal right now. I mean, if you look at it, Jordan Hicks was, by many accounts, the second best reliever available on the market. Ronaldo Lopez got three years, 30. So this is four years, 44, a little, an extra year, a little more AAV. Ken, what do you think about the deal for the Giants who obviously have money to spend or, and are trying to improve their roster? To me, it's similar to Lopez in that, yes, you can work him as a starter in spring training, see how it goes, and maybe even take that into the season. And if it works, great. Obviously, starters today are not used the way they once were. They're not going to be asking Jordan Hicks for seven or eight innings. And at the same time, if it doesn't work out, there's always the fallback of the bullpen where he is getting decent money for a reliever and he would be fine there. He's really good as a reliever. So I kind of like it. I like the creativity with it. And there's nothing set in stone here. If it doesn't work out, they've still got a really good reliever. Ken, so San Francisco now starting to make some progress, I would say, with their fan base that has been frustrated, expecting more from this team. They've had a lot of good winning over the past 15 years, probably the most successful franchise with the three titles that they had every other year. Okay, so now let's add this up. They added Lee. They added Robbie Ray. They add Jordan Hicks. Should Giants fans be satisfied? Would you expect them to do more? I keep thinking Blake Snell could be a fit here. Mm. I keep thinking a third baseman like Matt Chapman could be a fit. That's another name that's surfaced there. I would expect them to do more. What that is going to be, I don't know. And if Blake Snell's agent, Scott Boris, is asking for a price that the Giants are uncomfortable with, like the Giant, uh, like the Yankees were uncomfortable with, well, then Blake Snell will be a difficult ad for them. And yes, they have third baseman, but if you get Matt Chapman, you can DH J.D. Davis, you're a better team. 
I don't know if that's the way they're going to go, but there are other things that they can do, certainly offensively, to upgrade that roster. I would not expect that they're done. Is there is there a connection we were talking about the other day? Is there a connection with a team that has Boris clients? Is Giant are the Giants that team? You know how the Nationals used to have, you know, the connection with Boris, and it was like, hey, seven seven of the nine hitters in the lineup are Boris clients, and you know, two pitchers. Is there a connection there with the Giants? Because it feels like, depending on what the asking price is, we might need that for that to happen. That- Eric, that has happened, not just with the Nationals. The Texas Rangers got Semyon and Seager in one year. So it's certainly something that has happened in the past where there's been a run on Boris clients with one team. I don't know that it's necessarily going to happen with the Giants. Certainly they're going to be talking to Scott Boris about Blake Snell, even with this move. If you get Blake Snell, you want Blake Snell, regardless of signing Jordan Hicks to be a starter. So I don't think the Giants are going to be that team. But keep in mind, Matt Chapman is also represented by Scott Boris. So it's certainly possible that they're going to get another Boris client. I wouldn't rule that out by any stretch of the imagination. Hey, Ken, how you doing? Um, you ask. just seen Stroman go over there to New York. Uh, the Yankees, you got to be specific these days. Um, two-year deal. I think really good money. Do um, you think the Yankees are done? And how do you, how do you view that signing? Well... I was a little surprised by the money, actually, Adam. I expected Marcus Stroman to do a little better. He didn't do as well as Jordan Hicks. And he's a guy who opted out of a deal that was going to pay him $21 million this year. He gets a greater guarantee, but at a lower AAV. And in an offseason when starting pitchers have gotten really good deals for the most part, in my expectation, he was going to get a little bit more. And in some of the projections you saw, he was going to get more. Why did he not get a bigger deal? Who knows? Maybe it was because he's only pitched or he's pitched fewer than 140 innings each of the last two seasons. His vesting option is 140 innings, shockingly, with the Yankees. And maybe it's because he can be outspoken. He's an individual and he can say some things that sometimes tick people off. He's done it with the Yankees. I don't know exactly. Maybe it's a combination. Maybe it's none of that. But the health is a question. He's had some issues the past two seasons, not arm issues, but other kinds of things. And he's going to be, I believe, 32. So that is a question. For me, and I wrote this today, the Yankees cannot be done with their starting rotation. There are just too many questions there. Stroman from a health perspective. Rodon from a health perspective. Cortez from a health perspective. Clark Schmidt is a number five. Okay. But behind Gary Cole, who is your defending Cy Young winner, and at a time when Cole and Judge are in their primes, prime seasons of their career, and Juan Soto might only be under club control for one year, this group, to me, is not strong enough. Now, can they do something else? Maybe if the price drops on Snell or Montgomery. Maybe if they get a better deal on Cease than the one that the White Sox are proposing right now. Or maybe they simply play this out and wait until the deadline. But in my view, this group, considering where they are and the urgency with winning with Soto and with Cole and Judge at this state of their careers, to me, they need more. So where's that more? Because you kind of you – That's a great balked, question. You, you balked at the Snell. Obviously, if the market goes down, Boris isn't going to want that to happen. Snell's not going <laughs> to want that. And I don't see that happening because of the lack of pitching. Is there is there a creative starting pitcher that is out there? There might be. And certainly the Marlins are a team with starting pitching and a team that has been open to conversation. Jesus Lazardo, three years of control, is the pitcher that they have who is in the most demand. But, again, it's going to take a significant price to get Lazardo. He's a guy that is pretty good and has all that control left, and the Marlins are not going to give him away. They're going to want a significant return. So there are other things. There are always other things, Eric, right? Not just the names that we know. There are names that are out there that we might not be aware of. So I would expect they're going to be banging on some other doors. But at the same time, it's not easy to trade for starting pitching right now. It's going to cost you. And they've already made a costly trade for Juan Soto. A good trade in many of our estimations, right? But one that cost them a lot of starting pitching, at least in terms of depth.
And there's a great article that Ken put out this morning about the Yanks and tying it to the Stroman signing. And also, it happens to be one of my favorite articles, Ken, because there's a little mention on foul territory. We conveniently <laughs> had Jamison Tyon on the show yesterday and asked him about it. And he was really honest and said he really liked him. But also, he's like, yeah, he can be misunderstood and he doesn't give a crap what other people think. So that's all cool. He's familiar with the New York scene. He grew up in Long Island. So my question for you is the slice of that article about Stroman's past specifically with the New York Yankees. It sounds like he met with Brian Cashman before this deal was consummated. But at the same time, do you think there's anything to that or that's just Stroman's style? And maybe it even helps him because he'll have a chip on his shoulder since the GM that just signed him said he was not playoff rotation worthy a few years ago. Well, there's certainly something to it because this was all public a few years ago. Back in 2019, Brian Cashman said after the season, when asked why he didn't trade for Marcus Stroman, he said he didn't think he was a difference maker. And then Stroman had his say, and they went back and forth a little bit. Actually, that was all Cashman said, but Stroman said some things as well. So in this situation, what happened was these two parties needed each other. Stroman seemed to need a landing spot. Obviously, the competition was not necessarily what he anticipated because he signed for $37 million. And the Yankees needed a starting pitcher, and they didn't want to spend what it's going to take at the current rate for Blake Snell. And they weren't certain, by any stretch of the imagination, of getting Jordan Montgomery a pitcher that they traded because they felt he wasn't capable of being in their playoff rotation. The trades, they're going to be costly, too, for Dylan C's for for Corbin Burns, if indeed the Brewers move on from Corbin Burns, which they might not do until the deadline, if at all. So desperation makes for strange bedfellows. I don't know if that's a phrase or not, but Joel Sherman wrote a good column in the New York Post today basically saying these two sides were desperate. They needed each other. And I don't know that I would put it that strongly, but certainly there's something to that. There was a need for both parties to come together. And those words that were said in 2019 – Maybe they'll motivate Stroman, but it seems to me it's four years ago now, and I would expect that everyone's moved on. Oh no! At that price, at two year thirty seven, that I mean, that, doesn't that open up a lot of teams to have his services? You know, how big was his market at that price? Now, I get it. if he was asking for maybe twenty five or thirty a year, it changes. But at sixteen to eight, eighteen, I mean, how many teams were really, were really on him? That's one thing I'm not sure about him. And it's possible, certainly possible, and this might come out when he speaks to the media, that he had better offers from other places, but he wanted to go home to New York and wanted to pitch for the Yankees. Most players, you know this, they have somewhere in their hearts and heads an idea of what it would be like to pitch for the Yankees or play for the Yankees and how cool it would be. Most players like playing for the Yankees, even with all the pressures in New York. They like the way they're treated, it's first class, all of that. Not that other teams don't do that, but the Yankees have a good way and a good reputation along those lines. So that could be part of it, right, that he took less to play for the Yankees. But at the same time, it didn't meet what people expected from him. And if you look at the starting pitching market this season, from Eduardo Rodriguez at $80 million to Frankie Montas at $16 million, Stroman should be more toward Eduardo Rodriguez, I think, than Frankie Montas. And that's not how it played out. Ken, Ken, what do you think about the Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery markets at this point? Do you think that there's a price that's going to come down at some point and that's what's going on here? I mean, I'm still surprised that the Yankees feel like uh, maybe that's not the case, but it feels like they kind of closed the door on Snell and I don't know what the offer ends up being. But if I had to guess, Scott Boris probably is still holding at like a $200 million number that maybe teams are not going to meet. Well, certainly he has not found a team yet to give him whatever the number is. And I think it's probably even over $200 million. But with free agency, it's never over until the player is signed. And the Yankees, yes, they have not met Blake Snell's price. They made him an offer. He didn't like the offer. That's where it is right now. Doesn't mean they can't circle back if the market changes. I don't know that the market is going to change for Blake Snell. The Angels are still out there. They have not done anything big yet, and I expect that they will after losing Otani, whether it's Snell, Bellinger, whoever the case might be. So, again, if you're the Yankees, 
you're not going to just sit there and say we're done looking for starting pitching. They added some depth yesterday, too, with Luke Weaver. Maybe they go for some other pitchers along those lines to just bulk themselves up a little bit. But it seems to me they need one more quality guy and one more with a little more certainty to him. That's why I like Montgomery, even though he might not be available to them. Montgomery's going to take the ball, at least he has historically. He doesn't have the injury history recently that Rodon and Cortez and Stroman have. And that's the thing that concerns me most, the variability here with those three guys. This is an individual. This is, isn't an individual question. Why do we not hear from the player exactly what contract offers were? Why doesn't Stroman, you know, after this, you know, hey, who else was offering you? Oh, this team, this team. Why do we not discuss? Why is there such a hush hush? Is there something I'm missing on like, hey, you know what? The Orioles offered me 34 million and I wanted the extra 3 million. It's usually out of respect to those clubs. You don't want to embarrass them when they've recruited you and they've offered you 34 million, whatever the number might be. That seems to be just the decorum of how these things come together and proceed. Obviously, there are times where players say, yes, I turned down more money elsewhere, and we don't know where the elsewhere is, and we don't know how true that is, but you do hear that from time to time. But you rarely hear specific teams for that reason. Their agents advise against it. Probably a lot of players just don't want to do it anyway because it's a simple respect matter with those clubs. But the teams, but the teams sit there and they go, you know, the Red Sox this year, they lead the league in, we were in on this guy. They were in on so many guys. They don't say it publicly. In fact, the CBA okay. prevents teams from publicly stating what their interest level in free agents are, prohibits them from releasing offers. That is all going back to the collusion era. We don't have to go right. through all this, but they don't want a public airing of these numbers because it could affect the marketplace. That's the concern. So teams are not allowed to do that. Players generally follow suit. It's simply not the thing to do, I guess. Teams just leak it. Players don't. Well, yes, you do see that from time to time. No question. Okay, Ken, I want to take you to an article that has stirred up quite the feedback. And, you know, I took a unique approach this time, Ken. I saw the article come out, and I saw some other articles about your article and uh, extra social media feedback. So I was like, let me read some of this first, then I'll go into the article. Not sure I totally understand what people are talking about. So it's the article about Wander Franco. I think you provided more context on his situation and took us back to his signing when he was 70 games into his career. So can you give us more context on what you wrote and what you think about some of the feedback that you've seen on it? Yeah, well, it certainly did create more feedback than I anticipated. I was taken aback by it. I was left kind of speechless by it. I'm accustomed to people disagreeing with me in the comments or on tweets, whatever. That's par for the course. That's the age of social media. That's the discourse we're in right now. And frankly, that's part of the job. If I'm going to write opinions, people are going to have a right to say what they think. But I will say this. When the reaction, Scott, is this strong and this vehement from this many people, I have to look at it as there being a disconnect between what I intended to say what I wanted my message to be, and how it was received. And that's on me. If people are not interpreting it the way I thought they would interpret it, that's a poor job to some degree. I didn't make myself clear enough. So I wasn't trying to say, as some people have indicated, don't sign young players. I was merely pointing out the risk, the massive risk, when you give $100 million plus contracts to get guys who are 20, 21, 22 years old. If people are going to criticize me for saying, well, that's obvious, I would have understood that more. But people really saw this as me writing about an extreme case and not one that is necessarily applicable to any other. And I would agree with that. And I mentioned in the article that this is an extreme case. And I mentioned that Tampa Bay, if they had known or had any inkling of any of this, they never would have given them the contract. But I still thought it was worth exploring the things that I wrote about. In retrospect, would I have done it differently? Would I have framed it better? Would I have maybe not even written it because of the strong reaction that I've gotten? Maybe. And I'm not afraid of reaction. I'm not afraid of upsetting people. 
But when I upset them, I want to upset them for the right reasons. And in this case, it seems like there was that disconnect that I mentioned. It just didn't land properly. And again, I'll own that. I have to own that. And I've been doing this a long time. Doesn't mean you can't learn from your mistakes if this is a, indeed a mistake. It doesn't mean you don't go forward and keep this in mind in the future. I'm not going to ever be dismissive of my audience and their reaction. Now, when people say, well, you're an idiot for saying Shoy Otani's going to get this much money, that's one thing. This is another. And it really bothered me, obviously. I'm not going to lie about it. It bothered me that I was unable to make a point more clearly so that people kind of grasped it better. And again, maybe this was the wrong example to use. In retrospect, that probably was the case. But my goal with any column I write, any opinion column, is to make people think. And again, if I make them upset from time to time, that's okay. But I've got to make them upset by making my points clear. If I'm not clear enough and they're getting upset for reasons that I didn't anticipate, then something went haywire. And I have to say, something went haywire here. I respect that. And obviously you're putting out you know, a lot of articles on a weekly basis. Um, and this topic in particular with Wander's case, is a sensitive subject. The one follow-up I had is, we even have some fans in the chat that are like, oh, Ken is public enemy number one right now in San Diego for mentioning Fernando Tatis Jr. So that's the other layer I just wanted to ask you about. You specifically clarified in the article, the court case part is different. I heard a lot, our, everyone on this show heard a lot about Wander just with the Rays this year, not what is going on with his court case in the Dominican Republic, where he took a turn for the worst in terms of maturity, and that is listed in your article as well. I think it is fair to list you know, other players that are going through those situations, right, with their teams, or if it even causes an injury, like you wrote Tatis, I thought about Jared Kelnick, if he had signed a hundred something million dollar deal and ends up getting frustrated this year and hurting himself again. So anyway, what did you think about that part of it and, and the feedback that you got for just merely mentioning another player who's gone through some immaturity issues? Well, Padres fans, some of them, maybe a lot of them, are upset with a number of things I've written about them over the years. So that's, they're right. They can be upset. I would point out that most of the things we've written have come to pass. But we're not talking about that. The Tatis part of it, again, it was all part of the discussion that I was bringing out about the risk you take with a young player that you don't know exactly what you're getting because it's not a fully formed adult. Tatis made some mistakes. Now, I specifically say there is a sentence in there that says what he has done does not even compare to what Franco has done. But I'm just making the point that, again, these are massive risks teams take somewhat blindly. And the, another point I was making, and this was several times in the article, actually twice, what I'm advising is for teams to take a harder look at what they're seeing with these players before they sign them to these deals. And they all do their due diligence right now. I'm not saying they don't. But maybe this will force teams or compel teams to say, you know what, let's go a little deeper. Does this kid have enough support from his family? Does he have enough support from his agents? How is his maturity level? You go a little bit deeper. Now, maybe you're not going to know anyway. Obviously, the Rays didn't know with Franco. But that was part of it, too. And again, for the second time, I'm not advocating young players not to sign these deals or for teams not to sign young players to these deals. <clears throat> I've actually supported them over the years from Julio to Strider. All I'm saying is that it was a massive risk. Now, again, I'm not exonerating myself from what the reaction was. The reaction was what it was, and people took it a certain way for a reason. They didn't see it the way I wrote it. Okay. But as far as Tatis is concerned, I'm not comparing him to Franco. I'm just using him as an example, another example of a young player who had some speed bumps. And they were more similar to the speed bumps Franco had last year with the Rays than obviously what he's going through now. Well, do teams stop doing it? I mean, you no. have to lock up these young – these are because, again, Absolutely generational not, talent. Man. you got to well, lock right. them and up they, before they, they get way too expensive. It. Uh, no one's saying right. they should stop doing it. And, in fact, there's a good reason, as I explained, for these deals. 
you get these guys at below market rates for the primes of their careers and you're going to do it every time and you're going to do it even with the blind faith aspect of it. All I'm saying again is we can't just say there's no risk here. There's risk. Now, I'll repeat. Maybe this wasn't the example to use to make this point. Okay, I got it. All right, so do you think it's a societal issue, though? I mean, it's, again, like I said, if you wrote this article 20 years ago, it's going to be tough to get uh, to read all, all the comments. You can read a thousand comments in a minute. Do you think that now everything is glamorized with social media, with Instagram, and that his contract is all known? And it's like, do you, do you think that now... Um, even more than ever, athletes have become, I would say, and I'm not excusing any anything in any behaviors. I'm just saying, do you think athletes have become the prey in a well, way? Well, I don't know. And we're not, we don't know the outcome of this case. It, it's still evolving. If my but works. certainly we live in an age of more media saturation than ever before. And we all have to be cognizant of that. And when it comes to me and writing and even speaking on foul territory, I don't mind that people will comment on Twitter and I don't mind that they'll comment on my articles because in my view, it's almost a checks and balances. I know what the audience is thinking and I know what bothers them. I know what might upset them. And sometimes if I upset them too much or upset them for the wrong reasons as I seemingly did here, hey, I've got to learn from that. As for players, yes, they are under greater scrutiny too. And I know players don't necessarily go out as much now because they don't want people with cameras taking pictures of what they're doing. And things have changed. There's no doubt about it with social media. Are they prey? In some cases, that might be the case, yes. I don't know that it's always the case, but they are more careful, and they're more careful for a reason. This doesn't apply to the Franco situation here, but do you think teams – should be punished. I always thought about it during the steroid era, like teams turned a blind eye to things. I'm not saying at all the Rays turned a blind eye to things here, but should te there be a, there's a lack of culpability with teams when things happen. They'll give out the punishment, but they won't take any punishment for a team. I guess the Astros scandal now that I'm, now that I'm saying it out loud, but like, should there be a punishment for the teams or is this all completely individual things and the teams are never, never at fault? Well, each case is different and I don't know that you can make a blanket statement one way or the other, Eric. In this case, <laughs> this is an individual's action. In almost yeah. every case, when you have a, a player with a criminal activity or alleged criminal activity, it's the player. I don't know that you can hold the team responsible for that. If something happens in the clubhouse or on a team charter or a team hotel, even then it's still individual responsibility. I don't want to get too deep into this because I don't want to say right. anything stupid, but I have a hard time imagining how you can blame the team for an individual's action. These are still, while they're young men, they're still adults. You can. Really important combo here. Thank you for, uh, you know, providing context on what you wrote and the feedback and obviously even kind of seeing the instant feedback from fans, like just respect for just spilling it out. Um, and I'll say one more thing, Scott. I, I want to say mm -hmm. this. Sometimes I see comments like, oh, I just writes this for attention and for clickbait or whatever. First of all, we're a subscription site, so there's no clicking <laughs> involved. You can maybe get a subscription, but it's not like that. The other thing is, and I hope people understand this. I've talked at length about the report on Scherzer a few years back when I got it wrong. I take this stuff to heart. I take it really seriously. And if I do something that, in my judgment, didn't come out right, which I think in this case it's pretty fair to say it didn't come out right, then I'm going to hopefully fix that in the future. This is not a game for me. This is my livelihood. I've done this for a long time, and I take it really seriously and respect the people that I'm writing for and talking to. Yeah, they should feel heard on this one too, that that you see it and you're reacting to it. So th that's great. Ken, thank you very much. I mean, important, great to have you on right after all of that. So enjoy the weekend, hopefully some more signings, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks, guys.
Thanks, Ken. Ken Rosenthal, FT Senior Insider with us. That is good shit right there, though. So, I mean, Adam, Ken's putting out multiple articles a week. Obviously, it's one thing where he might say, I don't think this team has done enough and you're going to get, you know, blowback from fans. No, I like what they did or vice versa. I really like what they did. Whatever. That's fun baseball talk. We've had this come up lately, too. Sometimes you have to cover these really shitty situations that are going on that mix real life with our fantasy life, which is sports, right? We want to be the escape for the most part and just enjoy what's going on on the field. But you can't just do that. And when you cover a story like this, um, it's difficult. So I don't know. I, I respect the hell out of Ken for explaining it the exact way that he did. And also saying, I am not a bot. I am not the perfect writer and columnist. Like <laughs> I put things out there and I like to see what the response is. And he's not doing it to, you know, get clicks on some freaking, I don't know, uh, website that's paying them a few pennies at, at the athletic. That's not how, like he said, their website works. So it's right. not about that. For me, if, if I didn't know about Wander Franco or his case, I will tell you this. Most of that article was super informative to take you back to where that contract came together and push it all, all the way forward to now. So I thought a lot of it was pretty historical. Not every article has to be just full of opinions, too. Well, I think that people were mad, um, especially the Padres fans. I'm a Padres fan, so I was a little – but I read it and I understood and I comprehended it because I know the baseball world and the baseball life. I just think they were mad that, you know, with a case like this going on with, with Franco – and obviously Tatis, uh, you know, his immature behavior, whatever you however you want to call it, his mistakes, they don't correlate because they're completely two different mistakes, but they're still immature acts. So I think if you read between the lines, that's what he said. It's like, I'm just comparing two incredibly generational talents who made, you know, who made some immature uh, moves so far. And what do teams go through going forward? So when I read it, I just, you know, I, I knew that I had the access to Ken and be able to talk to him rather than like, you don't know what the hell you're talking about again. People on social media, you know, again, they make they, they make it to where people just don't even want to have the comments on there anymore because they just talk out of the, they call it talk out of that side of their ass. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad he was able to explain it. I, you know, again, he's the writer. It's great to hear him and hear his words from coming from his mouth because, again, he can go back and talk to the people and say what he wants, but they already have their opinions. We, as people involved in the sport firsthand, we know what it is and we know how to uh, evaluate all the, all the words that's written. There's a lot of good accountability there. Like you said, he had like one mistake on a report a million years ago and he still kicks himself for it. And meanwhile, we've seen <laughs> you know plenty of other flubs. So anyway, let's bring in our next guest. It takes right it personal. Now. That's great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, this is his life, yeah. right? I mean, I, I feel that. This yeah. is our life. Like majority of the hours that I'm awake is spent on, on the game, you know? And that is definitely right. the same case with my longtime friend, uh, the New York Post insider, John Heyman, joining us right now from what looks like a nice scene in, I guess, uh, the Florida range. So, John, great to see you in the short sleeves going. I'm, I'm a fan during the winter time here and a lot of action suddenly. So uh, we haven't spoken to you in a while. So let's go over what's very pressing at the moment. Uh, Marcus Stroman signing with the New York Yankees. What do you think about this deal and the fact that they probably are not going to add a top end starter like a Blake Snell? I'm fine with the deal. I mean, I like Marcus Stroman, really good pitcher, under four ERA, terrific competitor, a defense, a feisty guy. Uh, it'd certainly be good for us in the quotes in the clubhouse, so I like that. It's a plus. But if it means that they're not signing any bells, I, I think that's an issue. I mean, they, they their rotation does not look very sound right now. It's certainly got talent, but, I mean, Rodon, I mean, not only was he hurt last year, he was, frankly, terrible. Uh, Cortez was mostly hurt last year. Uh, Stroman, who's not really been injured much during the uh, career, he's been very good about avoiding that. And certainly not really any serious arm injury. He did miss most of the second half last year, majority of it. I mean, he was certainly uh, better than the other two. Uh, Rodon was not good even when he pitched. So, uh, and then certainly have Clark Schmidt, who's a back-end guy, but added Luke Weaver. But to me, it looks like uh, Garrett Cole, and then, you know, you're crossing your fingers after that. So... I'm I'm a fan of the Stroman signing. I'm not a fan of the idea that they're not going to get somebody else. John, how you doing? You looking nice and warm. Look like you probably shot a 95 today. Um, 
Okay. I, I, I have never <laughs> shot a 95 legitimately. With cheating, I would shoot a 95, maybe. <laughs> I have, uh, I have, a, I have a golf staff for you. They, I've heard only 10% of people have legitimately broken 100 in their career. 10%. Yeah. Think about that. Now you're, yeah. you guys are you're an athlete, so I mean you you can't even believe it. I'm sure, but I, I do. I, it's uh, there's no way I could break a hundred legitimately. I can break a hundred cheating. Yeah, most people can do that. <laughs> um, is Stroman a difference maker? I, I mean, right now, I I I think he's good. I, I mean, I think he's a really good pitcher. I, you know, Cashman had said in 2019, that's a good word. And I'm sure that's why you picked that word, that he was not a difference maker. And that's why they didn't get him. And I don't know if you guys recall this, but when he was traded to the Mets instead of the Yankees, and this is kind of funny because he's a Long Island guy from way out on the island. Normally that's Mets territory. Uh, he was quite upset to be traded to the Mets instead of the Yankees. He wanted to be a Yankee. And I think that's really the genesis for the rips that he did on the of the Yankees on Twitter. Uh, he was upset that he didn't get to go to the Yankees, and he wanted to be a Yankee. Uh, I mean, I, he certainly helps. Uh, you know, difference maker to me. Difference maker is uh, Dylan Cease. Uh, difference maker is Corbin Burns. Uh, difference maker is Blake Snell. Uh, I mean, he's a good pitcher. He certainly will make some difference. Uh, but to me, that rotation just isn't good enough. I mean, this is. We got Juan Soto for one year, right? And then he's a free agent. Uh, you want to make this year count. And I'm not sure they're going to be able to do that with the rotation that they do have. All right. Let's reference this. I think we're going to pull it up here. If we have this tweet about to a tweet or a comment about the Yankees, the Yankees lineup per not lineup roster per dollars is the least valuable productive lineup in baseball, even lower than the A's. What is your first reaction when you hear that? <laughs> Wait, hold on. Wow. Let me clarify. Did I not, did I not say you. that right? No, no, you didn't. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help him out. So this is a super chat from one of our fans because there's like, uh, you know, seven, eight hundred people watching live right now just on YouTube alone, John. So uh, <laughs> this is from Chris. The Yankees' payroll to valuation ratio is the worst in all of baseball. Worse than the A's. Yes, you read that right. The Yankees spend a smaller percentage of their total franchise value on players than the A's. This is according to Chris. So your thoughts on that? Do you think there's truth to that? And should the Yankees be spending more? That's interesting. I, I mean, they are a team that, uh, you know, spent well over $200 million more than a decade ago, right? So now they're a little bit over $300 million. Um, that probably has not kept pace. Uh, with their revenues. I mean, I, I couldn't cite exactly what their revenues are, but I, I think they're the highest in baseball. And uh, I think they're way up in the 800 to 900 million range. So uh, I could see that as a possibility. I don't know whether this guy has some uh, secret sources or he's uh, stolen some paperwork or what, but, uh, um, you know, it's possible. I mean, certainly the A's, they, they may have no revenue. So, you know, it's probably... That, that part of it is understandable, right? If you have no revenue, you know, you are spending a fair amount by spending almost nothing. But, uh, you know, uh, the Yankee payroll is in the top three with the Mets and the Dodgers. And, uh, you know, at, at one point, 10 to 15 years ago, it was clearly number one and their revenue was not nearly as high. So I could see that as a possible uh, issue or thought that it should go higher. But my issue right now is they need to get a, a better rotation because uh, right now, it's just not uh, its not very sound. I mean, I, I can't say it's not talented, because obviously Stroman is very talented, so is Rodon, and so is Cortez, but uh, it's pretty iffy. So I, I get the frustration there from some Yanks fans, John, because they're reminiscing about the days that you're referring to when they're just the big bad Yanks. They are number one payroll year after year. That's not the case. There are other contenders in that field these days. So I'm looking one more time for you on the Stroman signing, and he did finish the year injured. Um, Carlos Rodon was their big free agent starting pitching signing last offseason, hurt. Their big addition before that from the starting rotation was Frankie Montas. So do you think that the Yankees are more aggressive with starters that are coming off injuries and acquiring them? And is that burning them too much lately? They certainly have a problem with injuries, whether it's acquiring guys with an injury question or guys getting hurt once they get to the Yankees. I mean, obviously, they signed Garrett Cole to what was a record 
contract at the time, $324 million, that's a grand slam. He's the best pitcher in baseball. But other than that, uh, their record for signing pitchers over the last several years is not good. And the record for signing anybody, or acquiring anybody over the last three years has been, frankly, terrible. I mean, I mean, I think it's great that they figure 82 and 80 is a disaster. So that tells you something about where they stand and where they want to stand. But their record on acquisitions in the last three years is not good uh, for pitchers, for hitters, and the record for keeping guys healthy is abysmal. Um, you know, I mean, there were questions about Montas before they signed him. Uh, Stroman, I'm not that worried about. Uh, he has not had a long history of arm issue. I think he had a rib thing for the most part in the second half last year. So uh, that one doesn't bother me from an injury standpoint. The only thing that bothers me is that was it either or? I mean, we're either going to get Snell or Stroman. I mean, Snell, NL Cy Young winner. Stroman, 7 ERA over the last three months of the season. I mean, it wasn't a lot of innings, but, I mean, I think Stroman overall is a good pitcher, but that's not an either or question for the team with the highest revenue in baseball. You get Stroman, and then you move on and try to improve again. How is the dynamic going to be, too? Because Blake Snell never put any tweets out about Brian Cashman comments. Stroman has taken his down. Is there going to be, I get it, it was three, four years ago, but is there going to be any clash there? Is this something that was already talked about? How is this going to play out here for this season? Because you already have a guy in Alex Verdugo who comes with a little bit of baggage on the roster. Yeah, I mean, I, I assume they have to get past that. I mean, they signed him. They're giving him $37 million with a vesting option. Uh, they can't really – think of that as anything important. If they did, they wouldn't have signed him. Uh, you know, in, in some sense, I give Greg Cashman credit for having a thick skin. Obviously, he has to. He's basically getting killed by the fans every day for the last year. Uh, and again, they went 82 and 80. It's not like they were really terrible or really disastrous. Uh, I mean, they have looked past stuff. Remember when before they acquired Josh Donaldson, he made a comment about uh, Garrett Cole being the biggest sticky stuff guy. And, uh, you know, I think they just go by the talent generally, and they, they think they can uh, survive with uh, whatever character. I mean, obviously, there's some limit on the character, but, uh, you know, they think they can get past uh, an issue like that, whether it be a clash or something like that. Obviously, there are some big issues they want to avoid, and they've, they've avoided those really big issues. And I heard you guys interviewing Ken earlier. Uh, they've avoided those, but it seems like they're willing to uh, kind of butt heads a little bit with each other once in a while and, you know, try to resolve things. And I, I don't see anything wrong with that. And uh, I, I don't think Stroman is a bad guy. I think he's a guy who's very opinionated. Uh, sometimes he goes a little bit overboard, uh, but I don't think he's going to be a real negative in the clubhouse. I think he sells the game and he sells his brand. And I think we need more of that. And he's not afraid to do yeah. it. So let's yeah. shift all the way out to the West Coast. Is Jordan Hicks overrated? making him overpaid or because when you look at a Ronaldo Lopez signing, you know what he's done, he's kind of on this trajectory, but Jordan Hicks has always been the 105 mile an hour sinker, but the numbers aren't quite there in the aspect of a $11 million reliever. And now he's a starter. Yeah. I mean, he's got that big arm. So the giants are going to take a chance that they can turn him into a starter and get a bargain that way. Uh, I, you know, I'm not so sure this is a great idea. I mean, obviously, he's had a lot of injury questions. He obviously has a big arm, uh, and, but he has not really performed to the level of the arm, uh, even beyond the injury questions. Uh, it's a great job by the agency to get that contract for him, and maybe the Giants see something. And again, the, the Braves, maybe they see something in Lopez. I, I kind of think that's a gamble as well. I mean, Lopez may be in a better trajectory, but... Uh, he hasn't really lived up to his 100-plus mile-an-hour throwing either. I think they're somewhat similar, so I'm, gl I'm glad you put them together. I think they're kind of in the same ballpark in terms of incredible talent, big arm, really hasn't performed to the level of that arm or that talent. There's another big arm in the, at the back end of the bullpen who has performed, Josh Hader. Um, yeah. Haven't heard much about him. Uh, I know, obviously, he's probably going to be seeking Edwin Diaz style contract because the numbers say he should. Um, what's been the latest on him? Yeah, I mean, it's been very quiet. Um, you know, it doesn't mean nothing's going on. I, I do think he has been the best reliever in the game. Um, 
you know, obviously started with your Orioles, but uh, made his name with the Brewers and was really good last year with the Padres. Uh, maybe one of those two Oriole relievers was as good or better, but basically was one of the top three or four relievers in the game. Devin Williams also with Milwaukee, the guy who replaced them very good. But, you know, one two ERA last year. He should get uh, Edwin Diaz money. He's had a better career than Edwin Diaz. Diaz had that big year, uh, big platform year with 18 strikeouts per nine innings or so. Uh, record and that explains that to some degree. And I think he signed for 102 million, but with the deferrals, it was like 94 million. Uh, you know, to me, Hater is worth that. So we'll see what happens in the end. But I mean, if Jordan get, Hicks gets 44 million, I mean, certainly Hater is worth more than double. I mean, maybe that's a funny way to to calculate. But uh, you know, I still think that uh, the Dodgers, the Rangers, the the Cubs, I like the Phillies, although I think they're looking at right-handed. Maybe they'll go for Stevenson. I think they were in on Hicks. I'm not going to rule out the Yankees. Uh, as the, uh, what the viewer said, uh, they have big revenue, and they should be spending more. And uh, right now their bullpen doesn't look spectacular either. It looks better than the rotation, but it uh, couldn't hurt if they signed him. So uh, there are a number of reasonable options, logical options for Hayter, and to me deserves to be the highest paid reliever uh, in the game. Tell me if I'm wrong. It's Hayter and Stevenson. But where does Hector Neris, a very yeah. consistent older arm, where does he fit into this? It seems super quiet. I, like I haven't heard. I yeah. even had to ask if he had signed yet or not. Yeah, no, I think, you know, the numbers, his numbers have been good and he's been consistent. You're absolutely right, Eric. Uh, he's a really good pitcher. I think teams go by those secondary numbers like the velocity and the exit velocity against him and different numbers that we maybe don't see as much and those weren't as good so yes i think it has been very quiet with Neris. he has been a very good pitcher uh you know to me I, i'd be a, a guy who pays on performance and his performance has been really good i think some of these guys hicks included are paid on potential rather have a guy paid on performance and it would be cheaper anyway i mean obviously you know Hicks does have that big arm, that big potential, but Neris, to me, could be a very good deal for somebody. Uh, John, I'll finish with this. So who do you think needs to strike from a team perspective with still quite a few agent, free agents left to be signed, including at the top of the market? You know, I, I think we've talked quite a bit about San Francisco. They do pick up another piece. I think they yeah. should and still will do more. Uh, the Cubs just woke up the other day, right before Cubs Fest. That was good timing for them. But what do you think when you're looking out at the teams? Like, who do you think is going to spend, you know, maybe a couple hundred million bucks over the next couple of weeks? Because that is going to be spent somehow or another. Right. Well, I think you, you named the two top teams, the Giants and the Cubs. Those are the teams that probably will spend. If you ask me who should spend, I kind of like the Red Sox who should spend, right? They finished last three or four years. Their revenues are huge, maybe not quite the Yankees or the Dodgers, but they're pretty high up there. They're certainly in the top five in baseball. So I kind of think that the Red Sox have been in on everybody. I like some of their deals. I like Tyler O'Neill. I think Grissom's going to be really good. Um, I think Giolito can bounce back. But to me, uh, you know, they're acting more like a mid-market team. But I, the teams that I think still have more in them and, and are, will be aggressive are the Cubs and the Giants. And I think both teams have been in on Bellinger and – and Chapman, and you know, we'll see on Snell. I would think the Giants would be on him. I don't, I don't think you can assume Hicks is going to be a great starter. And let's not, well, let's take Hicks, not Snell. That's kind of like the Yankees. Let's take Stroman, not Snell. I don't quite get that. So, and the Giants have been an aggressive team. I mean, they're, they've done great from a business standpoint. They have tried to spend. They haven't always spent, but they've tried to spend. And I, I think they will continue to try to spend. But I, I think uh, Scott, you got the two teams right. I think the Giants and the Cubs are the teams left that will spend the most. It was five weeks left before spring training. What do you think my Orioles are going to do? You think they're going to uh, spend, spend some, either spend money, spend some of the players, the prospects? What do you see them doing before the start of spring training? Well, starting pitcher, I mean, they should be in the best position to get seats. Now, I'm not sure seats is going to be traded during the season. They may end up keeping him and uh, seeing how he does. Obviously, he didn't have his best year last year. Maybe his value would actually go up. Uh, they traded him at the deadline, but Cease is certainly a guy the Orioles have been connected to. That would be the most exciting piece for them. Uh, I'm sure that they, the White Sox would like Westberg and others, but the Orioles have terrific prospect capital to spend. So 
uh, if anybody should get seats, it's them. If they're not able to do that, I, I think they've been connected to Paxton, maybe Ryu, something like that. I know uh, last year they signed Gibson when we were all looking for them to do something bigger. Uh, they're not signing Snell and they're not signing Montgomery uh, unless the price really caves, which it won't. Uh, but they, they definitely are going to add a starting pitcher, whether it be the top guy, Cease, or more of a mid-range guy at this point like Ryu or Paxton. All right, this is the last one, and we'll let you go. The Marlins. Do they trade Luis Arise or Jesus Lazardo, which you just talked about the Orioles. Yeah. I think that will be a nice fit for yeah. them because they just need any kind of starting pitcher. But – do either one of those guys get traded? Wait, hold up. Are the Marlins rebuilding? I'm sorry. I, I have to jump in here. Marlins I, don't know, make money. Are, are they rebuilding yeah. again? Did they even I, build up to anything? What are we doing? I don't know if they're rebuilding, but I've heard everything is on the table. Does that mean that they're just switching people around and getting a diff, different players with the same payroll? Or does that mean they're rebuilding? They haven't really clarified it, but we know from other teams – that everything is on everything. I mean, not Yuri Perez. They're not trading him. Sandy Alcantara. He's not going anywhere. But everything else is on the table, from what people say. And I, whether I, you know, I mean, that would include a rise. So I, I think everything is out there. I don't think a rise will get traded, but I wouldn't put it past them. I, I do think that one of the pitchers will get traded, whether it's Lazardo or Cabrera. Maybe more likely Cabrera. I mean, Lazardo, three years to go. I mean, he's got big value and. Uh, that would be a little bit of a gamble to do that. They obviously have a lot of pitching capital, which allowed them to trade Pablo Lopez uh, last winter. It's still a controversial trade, but obviously Lopez was great. Arise was great. Uh, but Lopez isn't going anywhere. Arise, you got a new regime in there now. They may not think uh, the value is quite as high on Arise as the previous regime. And uh, I'm not going to put it past them to trade him, but I think more likely they would trade Luzardo or Cabrera. Are they rebuilding? That's a, that's a question for them. I don't know the answer. They're talking about everybody. I can tell you that. Ugh, John, I know, because you're in, somewhere in that area, and you know I spent a lot of time down there. I'm very frustrated, very frustrated as they're trying to reset again and become the Rays. And uh, you, You're obvious with the Peter Bendix hire. That's fine, but uh, I need 30 minutes for a therapy session on that, and I know you got to <laughs> jump. Go break some news for us. John, thank you so much, and just for everyone else uh, to see again, John Heyman, obviously you can follow him on Twitter, but check out all his – Articles, including his latest notes column in the New York Post and his show actually this week, the show with John and Joel Sherman has David Stearns on there. So which is great. I have some weekend material to listen to. So, John, do a great job there. Thank you so much. Good to see it. All right. Great to see you guys. See Eric, Adam, Scott. Great to me as always. Cheers. Thanks, John. John Heyman with us on FT Live. Good stuff. Um, so next in about 10 minutes, by the way, for everyone. Ryan Helsley will join us and give us more context on Jordan Hicks and does he think that he can properly convert back to starting pitcher and become a full-time starter or whatever they're going to call it. You know, they have different names for starters sometimes in San Francisco. Um, but let's spend a few minutes on some money moves. The Abed MGM lines for you have to do with, first off, news with the Atlanta Braves, and then we'll look at their World Series odds. Alex Anthopoulos is at it again. It's extension season. This time... It's himself <laughs> through at least 2031, 2031. Wait, That's big. That's what? long. That is really long. Good so what is it? It's 2024. It's an eight year, eight season, eight season. He's extension. locking damn self up. How do you, how do you <laughs> go through those contracts? You'd be like, look, I, my, I've been good. My perform, my team's been good. I deserve a seven year extension. Like this. <laughs> He's like, you get an extension. You get an extension. You get an extension. He's doing My turn. He's he's doing the two for you, two for you, one for me, two for you, one for me, three for me, five for you. Top three. But see, if a contract extension like this exactly. comes out, yeah, yeah, but like, why why don't we know about like the financials? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely seven figures. Let's just be honest. With so he's a general manager for a, for a team like. We never know about their financials. Ours is blasted over on, on the bottom line of it. You're making fourteen point two five five six five one dollars per year. You're right. I when think our next GM comes on, when our next GM comes on, 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 we'll ask him. And what you make? Won't answer. Yep. How much do you, <laughs> like like when you go and talk to a fourth grade class. How much money do you make? <laughs> ah, the teacher's like, oh, that uh, that's not a good question. <laughs> nah, it's a good question now. Yeah, exactly. we, we need to normalize that in baseball. I think it's important in baseball because, yeah, 
GM's front office leaders, the good ones, are getting paid, paid. Is he Spolstra? Managers need to get paid more. Who? Oh, Eric Spolstra. Oh, Spolstra. What was the number? What was the final number for him? Spolstra. Adam, you're getting a little, Adam's a little, a little weird on kids, us. Kids are on, on the Wi-Fi. switch. 102. 102. Oh. 102. 8102. Wow. So we publicized Craig Council's deal. That was a good start, right, to try and get managers back on track. Uh, five years, $40 million. I guarantee you that Alex Anthopoulos is making much more. Adam, he gone. But um, <laughs> that's a long deal. And the Braves are that team because anybody that they truly value, they sign for a long period of time if they will accept a contract like that. And, and that includes their president of baseball operations and Kratz, I don't think anybody can doubt that he is in the top three. Nobody Absolutely. can doubt that. You want you want to say he's not number one? You want to say someone like Andrew Friedman right now? Okay, but and I don't really care. But I'm just saying, like this is one of the top few front office executives in the sport. So if you're going to give out a ridiculous contract and a long one, this is a guy who deserves it. He's young. He's passionate. Like he he still is going to work through that contract, no doubt about it. I don't I don't know what is he maybe in his mid forties like that that's no big deal and he gets to plant down with his family in one spot and have the continuity too, which is important. Clearly, it's important when Shohei Otani has a clause in his contract mm-hmm. that says if the owner or the GM slash Povo whatever the job is I guess technically he's president of baseball operations Andrew Friedman if either of them leave Shohei Otani can opt out of his contract that should show you what the importance level is for somebody that's that talented at their job and how important it is for players too, right? Like I'm sure the Braves players are like, cool, we got a dude that knows what he's doing running the ship for a while. It matters because you're setting a culture. Who did we talk about after we talked about Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, after you talked about the players, yeah, Bochy got some love, but see why Chris Young got a lot of, credit for building this team, but also building the idea of what it takes to win a championship. Alex Anthopoulos is doing the same thing. I saw him in his younger days of being a GM and we had it out. We had a very deep heart to heart where I did most of the yelling and he did most of the listening. And to see where he's at now, there is, there's not many GMs that, like you said, I would say, yeah, great job. This is perfect, perfect distance of time. This is a perfect length of contract. Good for him. He deserves it. He has done things on different spectrums too. People will say, oh, he's got a, he inherited all these young, good players. He has, but he's also convinced them to stay in Atlanta. He's won a world championship. They're probably going to fight for more of them over the next five to seven years because of the different things that he's done. And he's still building it in a unique way when teams would be like, ah, you know what? I don't really need to do anything. We're really good. Now on the other end of that, I I feel like we need to bring these contracts out more to the public because there are some baseball jobs that are super valuable and very time consuming and directly contribute to winning. And those people don't get that much money relative to what the sport looks like. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's kind of, I don't don't know exactly what you're saying, but the managers – The managers, other other front office members, assistant coaches, like all of those roles. I think some people sometimes think like, oh, well, they're in baseball. They get paid well. I'm like, most of them don't relative. It's all one year contracts. They're one year contracts. They're often, you know, not six figure deals. And there's people that are spending literally their entire day there. And I get it. It's baseball. It's fun. But you can't say, oh, that's just how it is. They chose to be. In baseball because they're like there's plenty of money to go around it's just not going around because the standard's been set and they keep those salaries as secretive as possible so at some point i feel like that damn will break we had a great combo with Derek johnson who uh, runs the reds pitching the pitching coach there about yep. this remember eric yeah. i don't know yeah. if adam was there but yeah. it was i was it was informative you were on that one too yeah he was on that one. Yeah, yeah i was it's great to hear that because you know you hear Again, you, you go to the minor league cities and been to minor league parks, whatever. You go out, you, whatever. You, people think, oh, you're a professional baseball player. You make a lot of money. Whew. I, I mean, me, I was fortunate to be a first-round pick, but, I, again, seeing the four-year college guys, seeing the guys with $100,000 of debt, you know, there's such a bigger story. And, you know, 
I think when you see the stories of the guys, you see it every Christmas of the guy who got to the major leagues or got a contract and able to retire his parents, pay off his parents' debt. Like those are genuine tears because they, the parents know that you, no one does that. You die with those bills. But you know, if you're able to be the one percent of this game, and then the point zero 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 one percent of that that is able to make a substantial living, like it's such a blessing. It's so hard. And again, on that side also, you see why coaches don't retire. You know, I had Wayne Kirby for a long time. He's he's out now. But why would a coach retire? You're getting a substantial salary. You got kids, so you're getting that insurance. Oof, that's the number one thing I figured out once you retire. Yeah, damn, that insurance bill's high. Um, but it's like these are all the things that you never think about. He's like, so the Yankee, I mean, uh, the Cardinals coaches. I'm like, dang, why ain't they retiring? Well, they make a six figure salary. I don't know, but they're getting one full share for a decade straight. I ain't retiring either. I'll dig it. I'll, I'll flip the pool holes and Ray Langford and all them dudes back in the day to get to get on that. And you know, you that's why you see it. And it's a blessing to to be able to do it. And it's hard to sustain and to be in this game and to be good at your job for a long time. And again, it's different at the front office, especially when you got power. But to be st- to still be good, it's still hard. So kudos to him and kudos to Chris Young, who you mentioned. Who both these guys have baseball people around them, but then they got baseball players around them. So they have the perfect mix. And a quick review of the odds from last year for the Atlanta Braves. So they essentially entered the season at plus seven fifty. They displayed their dominance over the year. And by mid-July, which is when we're judging about the midway point of the season, they were plus 375. And then heading to the playoffs, they were plus 250. I think a lot of a lot of dough was put down on the Braves to win the World Series, Kratz. I think the Braves and the Phillies got a lot of love on the National League side. And uh, we know who won. As it kept going on, they got a lot of love. But I'm actually kind of surprised by that plus 750. Like, that shows what that offense did throughout the entire year. Going all the way into the last game of the season, you're like, oh, man. I mean, Acuna just never stopped. And it was like, yes, he's the MVP, but there's other dudes in that in that lineup that just had career years. What did they have? Six All-Stars? Seven All-Stars in their lineup? It was It was wild. Wild, and I I expect those odds to be right around that plus three fifty by the time the season starts. So to see that plus seven fifty is that's high. I don't I don't remember it being that high. Yeah, but they have the Dodgers now to mess with, and there's yeah, serious cash going down on the Dodgers right now. I know. I'm I'm just saying. I'll take the, the Dodgers field. didn't look like this last year. I know you'll take the field, but I'm saying this is why it's a little bit different coming into this season. Right now, as I have it, Dodgers are at plus 375, and the Braves are at plus 700. Hey, so it gets it gets higher than I thought. It gets higher than I thought at the beginning of the year. And the Yankees are third at plus 900. Interesting. I would not touch that. Mm. Um, <laughs> anyway... A quick look at the Million Dollar Playoff Football Challenge going on right now. BetMGM Sportsbook account holders who create an entry in that challenge have an opportunity to win a share of a million dollars in bonus bets if you predict the three playoff football questions correctly out of the eligible users. Each entry period has three questions. You log into your account. You go to the promo tab on your account and complete. Can I say complete? Complete and submit uh, the challenge. One entry per customer permitted per entry period. Gambling problem or concern, call 1 800 Gambler. We're going to talk to Ryan questions. Helsley soon. What's up? They're easy questions. If you go on there, they're they are easy, easy questions. questions. You're right. But you got to nail them. Yeah. Who's going to win each of these three games in a wild card? Like, it's, it, you're, not, you're not asking, you know, it's not smarter than a fifth grader question. So it is, get on there, do it. It is worth a shot. Yes. Uh, until Ryan Helsley joins us, um, we got all those arbitration numbers finalized so did anything stand out to you guys I I thought the one tweet from a guy who I I usually follow who sometimes puts out some fire uh, Matthew Pouliot he said that he thinks the guys at the top of the market should be pushing the envelope a little bit more in terms of what they're asking for you know no do you disagree so Shohei Otani got 30 that set the record Soto got 31 I got to look back at what Pete Alonso ended up with. It was 20 something, right? 20. In the low 20s. 
I thought he got 20. 20 I thought he got 20 even. 20 and a half. 20 and a half. 20 and a half. Yeah, 20 and a half. That's the number. And then he's a free agent after this season as well. But here's what Matt said. For the 23rd year in a row, I really wish players would be more aggressive in our basks. Alonzo is settling for less than George Springer got with five years of service time four years ago. And arbitrators have always loved RBIs, which I think is funny that they don't know shit. So they're like, cool, RBIs, which I love, but they like they haven't really kind of advanced themselves into learning much more. So anyway, you're, you're shaking your head, though, Kratz. You don't think they should be pushing it a little bit more? What do they have to lose? I'm all about pushing it. What do they have to lose? They have a lot to lose. If you push it, like look at Adolis. Adolis Garcia's difference is like, what, $1.9 million? Yeah. That's a lot to lose. Like, I get it. Guys are talking about $20 million. He's talking about the top of the market guys who you're talking about. Like, how much do you want him to push? How much more do you want Juan Soto, who is – I'm going to probably get roasted for this. He's not a better player than Shohei Otani. So he got to get roasted for that. (laughs) I mean, people are going to be like, oh, he's the best hitter ever. And they're not going to remember the fact that Shohei Otani, as I said, is the best player in the game by far, but nobody wanted to agree with me. Everyone wanted to say Acuna. But anyway, Juan Soto (laughs) got a million more just, Uh just a year later. So, to me, I think how how much more do you want to push it? Because if you put if you don't push it, let's say Juan Soto goes and says, I want 33 million. Yankees say, okay, well, we think you're worth 29. They're gonna give you, they're gonna, they're it's gonna be hard to persuade the arbiter because he's not looking at different, he or she is not looking at all this emotional stuff. They're just looking at the numbers and saying, mm, no. We're gonna get. We're gonna give you what you give you. Now, now he's now he's downgraded the market. To me, players need to incrementally grow, go up, just like owners want to incrementally, slowly keep it as low as possible. Because owners are gonna be there ten years from now. Players will not be. The next player will be there, and so if they keep it incrementally low, then they're winning in the long term. But players need to just slowly, incrementally stay the course, continue to pump it up, and guys lose all the time when they go too high. True. I mean, you got you to get that midpoint. If you can find that midpoint, that always works. Um, like you said, if if you're with Soto at, at that number, like you're fighting for a small percentage. Um, if you are, you know, like a Dulles, a million, a million nine, that's a big difference. That's a big percentage. In five percent. and six yeah. point. That's a big difference. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know if many people know about arbitration hearings. I remember one. Um, it, it, was, it was my boy Alejandro Daza. He, he was – it was five million and five five. And I'm sitting there like, bro, don't go. Five is plenty. And he's like, Poppy, I need that 500. I'm like, hey, do what you got to do. He came back head down and was like, Poppy, they ripped me a new one. I didn't know I was so bad of a player. I was I was me and after me and Delman or something, we were laughing so hard because we know the arbitration process. And like you see with Corbin Burns, there was hush hush on that. He got it done, knocked it, knocked it away. So um sometimes you just want to avoid it. And then again, when you're uh, almost two million apart on and you're under ten million, oh yeah, you you gotta you gotta fight for that. Now if you're talking fifteen eight and 16 nine all right we can, we can figure that we can figure it out real quick yeah uh, i want to ask bernsey about his number it's like 15 million six hundred and thirty seven thousand five hundred dollars i'm like did, he did needs you like, that 500 too 500 dollars that's what that's what i wish i wish he'd be like 502 dollars <laughs> cents. We're not going to have time to cover this because we're going to talk to Helsley in 10 seconds and then um, we're going to jump, but we'll talk obviously more on Monday. But look up the case of Casey Mize because they're going to they're going to arbitration court over 25 Gs, which is insane. <sighs> insane. Uh, and and he's barely over the league minimum oh mark and he was the number one pick and he has pitched. <laughs> not like he hasn't pitched at all. Anyway, we don't have time for that. Ryan Helsley, super closer, super reliever, St. Louis Cardinals <laughs> pulling over for us. And some fresh money in the pocket, too. So we'll start there. So first off, dude, congrats. How did that all go down? Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, it went smooth. You know, it uh, feels good to go into spring and know what you're making, you know, to not have 
not a distraction, but, you know, something else weighing on your mind. So it feels good to, you know, have all that squared away and, you know, hit the ground running. How did that go? Can, can you give us any other insight? Like, are you one of those that's super involved or, hey, agency, I pay you money so that you handle it and you just call me when I have to make a decision and you have to give me some information? Yeah, I'd say a little bit of a mix. You know, I think that's why you hire them to let them talk the money, you know, but I like knowing, you know, how the process work, process works out. And, um, you know, they called me about once a day, to, you know, say how their conversations went with the team and, you know, kind of fill me in. And um, so it was it was a fun process. How what, what was that? Like, I, I'm always interested. Like, you agreed to what you agreed to. Were you way higher? Were they way lower? And you met at that point? Did you get a little bit past the 50, you know, half halfway point? How, how did it work out for you? You don't have to tell us what the numbers were that you were going with, but we talked about it yes, two days ago or yesterday, Todd Frazier, before they went in to, you know, file, the team said 6 million. He said 18 million and they met at 12 million. Like, so that's super extreme, right. but how did it work for you? Yeah, I would say we probably met somewhere close to the middle. Um, I don't know exactly where they started at but i know you know from talking to my guys they felt like it was a very fair offer and they're really excited about it and you know they both both sides worked well together i think and you know i think after last year it was big you know not having to go through that again and then you know just kind of make amends and you know the the process this time was much better and i think from what i was told it was very smooth okay so you got some good money really good money you and jordan hicks still friends yeah, of course. Okay, so then he can pay for dinner from now on because he got some, <laughs> he got a little bit of extra cash. Free agency is different, and I want you to give your honest opinion on this. Is Jordan Hitz going to be a good starting pitcher for the San Francisco Giants? Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't know he was starting. One of my other buddies actually texted me and was like, "Yo, Jordan just got paid," and I had to Twitter search it real quick because I was working out during the time and. Uh, you know, I think he can be for sure. You know, he's young and he pitched all throughout the minor leagues as a starter and has some experience in the big league starting. Um, I think if he could find a third pitch, you know, that he can throw for strikes a lot, you know, he could have some success because obviously he throws 100 and, you know, has crazy movements. So I think, you know, honestly, the sky's the limit for him. The extra four seamers they started throwing last year. Is that something, obviously it was on purpose. Is that something you think could be a third pitch because of that sinker is – so devastating it's almost like a left-handed slider and a four seamer from a lefty like do you think that could be some because i saw now he didn't throw a ton of them he only threw over a hundred some but he had one walk on the four seamer and he had 18 punch outs like that's something mm -hmm. that an analytically driven team which the cardinals maybe are not quite up to par on that stuff is going to exploit and really try to use more or what's that what's that chatter from him in the bullpen like yeah, I mean, you know, I played catch them every day for the last two years while he was with us, and, you know, we would long toss, and he's trying to throw sinkers 200 feet, and, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to talk some sense into him, hey, throw something a little straighter, man, we can play a little bit better at catch, and, you know, I'm not taking all the credit for it, but I like to say I, I put a little bug in his ear to throw a four-seamer, you know, and obviously having that pitch that, you know, rides to the top of the zone, and, you know, it's completely different than a sinker, I think can really help him a lot, and obviously, like you said, he's had great success with it already, and, you know, you see guys all the time switch teams and, um, you know, they make adjustments with their pitch pitches and they, you know, find success. So that's it's going to be cool to see him and see what the Giants do and, you know, adjust on that for him. Do you think it could take away from his sinker? I'm always leery of guys that are really good sinker ball pitchers. Now, he's an elite, you know, velocity sinker ball pitcher, but – the guy starts throwing a cutter and it kind of flattens out that sinker a little bit. Did you see that being a guy that had eyes on his arm every single day for the last two years? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, he kind of uses it as like an off-speed pitch. You know, guys don't ever really see it. So I think, you know, whatever his cue is for, for a sinker, obviously it's different for a four seam. And I think he's been able to really figure that out. And like you said, he only walked one person with his four seam. So he's got some feel for it, obviously. So I think, you know, if he can – just nail that down and get that more precise and consistent, you know, I think he could, you know, make it into a real weapon. 
Ryan, so I'm looking at the pitch usage this past season for Jordan, and it's different, we know, as a reliever versus as a starter. And I know his velo ticked down a little bit from a billion to like one or two shades under a billion when he was starting a couple <laughs> years ago. But he was a little over 64% sinker, about 20% sweeper, a little over 10% four seam, and then like barely using, you know, I guess what they registered as a slider separate from the sweeper. So what does he have to do to be an effective big league starter now. I mean, we saw it in a little taste a couple of years ago and I don't think it went that well. I know he's still kind of working his way back from things, but does he need to add another pitch? Have you seen other pitchers that are able to thrive with two pitches at an elite level like that as a starter to get through a lineup three times? Yeah. I mean, right off the top of my head, I, you think of Jacob deGrom and Spencer Strider, you know, just fastball slider, really. Um, you know, you see Strider and deGrom both have really good changeups too, but you know, the other two pitches are so good and they throw so many strikes, you know, they can get away with it. And obviously they throw a million like like Hicks does. So, um, you know, I think this year Hicks really found his slider. Like he's always had potential for it. Um, I think that's what kind of helps his strikeout numbers along with the four seam. And, you know, I think if he can, you know, improve those and keep attacking guys and getting ahead, you know, and facing guys two, three times is a lot different than facing them once or maybe once every other day, however it works out. But, you know, I think he could... You know, maybe add another pitch. You know, I think that's something that, you know, he's probably going to be open to, especially being a starter. You always want more weapons. And, you know, as a hitter, if you got to worry about four pitches instead of three or three instead of two, you know, it just makes it that much more difficult. You're always sitting next to him down there in the pen. And the bullpen is a different – it's a different country. Like, the field, starting pitchers are different countries. Is Jordan Hicks going to be able to have the starter lifestyle – is he going to miss being down there with with the hooligans in the bullpen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like from talking to him when he was doing it a couple years ago, that's kind of what he's always wanted to do in the big leagues. Like, obviously, a guy like him profiles better in the bullpen and, you know, it's go out there and let it eat for 15 pitches versus an hour and a half to two hours and trying to cover six or seven innings and facing guys three times. You know, it's, it's a lot different of a mentality. And, you know, I, I haven't started since the minor leagues, but I remember – you know, the whole day before your start, you're kind of getting anxious and, you know, the hours leading up to it, you know, it's all you're thinking about. But bullpen's a little different. You know, you can't be locked in 365 or 182 games, however many it is, you know, you're going to wear yourself out. And, you know, I think that's probably what adds to a little bit of the, the circus or the zoo down there in the bullpen. You know, you got to keep your mind a little freer. Obviously, you're locked in watching the game, but, you know, you can't be sitting on edge for nine innings and every day you're going to wear yourself out down there. Ryan, good to see you. Um, hey, you too. You mentioned Sp you mentioned Strider and you mentioned Degrom, two guys obviously high in velocity, two to three pitches. You can, you can say three, um, but get a lot of strikeouts. But inning eaters also. How can Jordan Hicks become a starter and do that? Yeah, he's not the most swing and miss guy, but if you're trying to go again deep into ball games, the sinker ball is definitely the pitch to have. Do you think by him having two really elite pitches, the fastball slider? Joining Robbie Ray, who has two elite pitches, the fastball slider, that can work, especially in a cold environment like that with a good infield defense. Yeah, I think so. You know, I think, you know, maybe this first year, this might be a growing year for them, you know, just letting him, so to speak, just go, you know, just let him pitch, let him learn from his mistakes and just let him go out there and make himself a better starting pitcher. And, you know, a guy that throws a – 100 or 98 to 100 with a sinker like that it's, it's always going to be hard to hit even if you know it's coming and you know he's throwing a sweeper slider off of that too that's you know 88 to 92 it's going to be tough and i think you know the key to any good pitcher is just being in the zone you know getting ahead and you know it's, it sounds so cliche but if guys can just work ahead you know it obviously goes in favor of the pitcher a lot more i had a couple fan questions to mix in here um kelsey bird actually puts out some great baseball content too says can we hear from hells on what adjustments might look like for hicks in terms of velo as one of the only other guys in the league that throw that kind of heat yeah i mean i think for him obviously you want to hold your velo you don't want to taper off you know innings five six and seven and i think for him, it's going to be figuring out this off season, you know, this last month and even throughout spring training is how can he, you know, keep that the whole 100 pitches, 110 pitches for 32 starts, 35 starts, you know, into the postseason. You know, it's going to be it's going to be a grind. It's a different kind of stress than throwing 15 pitches, you know, back to back days or even three days in a row. It's just different on the body and it's going to take some adjusting, getting used to. And, 
you know, they had, San Francisco's had some good starters and um, in past, and I think they got some good ones out there still. And you know, maybe they can build off each other. Logan Webb and him kind of have similar arsenals. You know, maybe he can feed off of him and you know pick his brain a little bit. Who's had a lot of success at the big leagues, and you know, it'll it'll be fun to see and watch him develop. Is it fun to watch the free agent market right now? As a guy who's going to go through arbitration one more time after this year, is it fun to watch the market? See your guy, Jordan Hicks, get his forty-four million. See Ronaldo Lopez get his thirty million. Kind of guys in bullpens that are like, you know what? I'm doing way better than both of those guys. Is it fun to watch? And who in the market right now are you looking at? Like, I kind of want to see what Hater's going to do. Maybe I don't quite have the Hater numbers, but Haters on another level. You, you, and Devin Williams are going to come out at the same time in a free agency. Is that exciting? Like, are you looking at like maybe getting a Lambo instead of the, the <laughs> ride that you got right now? Uh, yeah, I'm not much of a, a car person. You know, I'd rather buy like a four wheeler or some side by side or something. You know, and I'm more of a country guy. I don't really care about vehicles that much. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's going to be exciting. You know, Devin Williams has had a great career too. You know, I think in comparison with Hater minus the saves, you know, stuff wise, strikeouts, everything of that nature, you know, he's as good as anybody too. And has had a crazy start to his career and has been as consistent as bad as you can be in the bullpen. And, um, it'll, it'll be fun. You know, it's fun seeing, you know, your teammates and your friends hit free agency and, you know, just watching how guys and their careers progress and go along. So, you know, it's, it's definitely something to look forward to, you know, not trying to look too far into the future, just trying to, you know, focus on the now and, you know, God willing, one day I get there, you know, it'll be exciting and a fun process to go to go through. You mentioned it very briefly about how you were starting pitcher in the minor leagues. And obviously, you're, you know, hell of a closer. For people who don't know, what's the biggest difference between conditioning and strength off seasons between a reliever and a starter? You don't you know, you're not going to throw uh, 180 innings, but you still got to train like you're going to throw 180. Innings. so like, what's the difference of, of training from a reliever to a uh, to a starter? That Hicks is going to Yeah, for me, right. Yeah, for me, I think the biggest thing is like bullpens leading up to it. You know, I think a starter going into spring, you're going to throw 50 pitch bullpens probably, you know, and then higher intent bullpens one day. And you got to mimic up downs and, you know, you got to give yourself that time to adjust and be ready to have that lengthy season. Whereas, you know, in the bullpen, especially with the pitch clock now, you know, I think training's going to have to change. And, you know, you only have 15 seconds or 18 seconds now to, throw a pitch and I think you have to really focus on that and change the mentality of being able to do that every so often instead of you know having these longer breaks and not feeling rushed as much and you know for me and my bullpens you know I'll throw closer to spring training I'll throw like two sets of 15 you know for the times I go one plus or two innings just so it's not you know something new and a shock to my body and you know I've thrown a lot of innings in the minor leagues as a starter and done quite a few up downs in the big leagues too so i kind of know what that feels like and know what i need to get my body to be able to succeed with that all right another fan question coming your way here ryan this is from d-rod one of our regulars um is st louis the easiest city to play baseball in your experience obviously you're not going to be like well this is my eighth team so it's probably a better <laughs> question for for kratz even though i mean obviously it's just spend time there on the other side but from your teammates some have been well traveled what do you think yeah, it's probably up there, you know, like fan wise, I think they do a real good job of supporting you, you know, um, especially being at home, obviously, they're not going to boo you as much as a place like, you know, Philly or Atlanta or, you know, a New York team, you know, those East Coast teams like that. Um, but yeah, personally, it's great to play there, you know, we have great fans, you know, they're, they're fans of the game, you know, I feel like they just appreciate good baseball and, you know, they're in tune with the game and are dialed in, you know, and so hopefully this year um, we can give them a little bit more something to cheer about. So, and we've talked to you about this already. There hasn't been a ton of action since. There's been a little bit, like the Andrew Kittredge deal um, brings another friend to the bullpen who's had good success. Thoughts right now on what you've seen from the offseason from St. Louis? I know they did most of their damage early on. Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely made improvements. You know, we're going to have guys who've been there, done that, and, you know, pitched at the highest level for a long time. And, um, you know, I think our bullpen – it's going to be good this year, too. You know, we got a couple guys in JoJo coming back and Gio, who's had a lot of success in the trade we just made for Kittredge, you know. And then we got four guys, you know, who could really, you know, be a threat back there in the back end. And, you know, we got some younger guys, too, that, you know, have a lot of a lot of good stuff and plus stuff. And, you know, Thompson or Libertor, if they 
make the team out of camp and Andre Pallante who's pitched a lot, you know, so, you know, I think we're going to be good. Um, it's going to be exciting to get to camp and, you know, get to know the new, new guys and, you know, go from there. And how much are you paying attention to the rest of the division right now? Anything stand out to you in terms of moves? I mean, obviously, you know, we know, we know the classic rivalry with the Cubs. They've been pretty quiet so far. They just locked up uh, Imanaga the other day, but that's really the first move that they made. There's still plenty of free agents, obviously, still out there. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I think the Reds have made a big splash. You know, I think, you know, they got a taste of success last year and, you know, they got a good young core. And I think, you know, they're wanting to build on that. And, you know, they're going to be a good, good ball club. You know, there's, they always play us really tough, you know, whether we're there or we're at home, but they got a good team. And, you know, the Cubs are going to be good again. And the Brewers always can pitch, you know, and um, the Pirates got a good young team too. You know, I think it's going to be a competitive division. Um, it's going to be an exciting year. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Do players have wish lists? I know I did as a center fielder and you know, I was the leader of the team. I'm like, hey, I want to get this guy to get this guy, uh, especially <laughs> as I built more cachet. Uh, do you have a wish list? Like, man, damn, I want to, I want, I want somebody to set me up or I would like, you know, I would love to have this guy, this guy. Do you have a, do a wish list or just guys that obviously you admire and, you know, respect throughout the game, but guys you would like to play with? Yeah. You know, I obviously thought we might bring Hicks back. I thought that'd be cool. Um, you know, I feel like with today's day and age, you look at good bullpens, you know, most teams have like two closers, you know, obviously you want to be that guy in close, but you know, when you, get to the the playoffs you know like you see it all the time you know Kimbrough was throwing the eight some and your closers are throwing the eight if it's you know two three four coming up you know you might need him to go now and that's the biggest point of the game you know a lot of times obviously you lose the game in the ninth but you can win the game in the seventh and eighth too just like you can in the ninth so I think you know having deep bullpens especially if you want to make a good playoff run is important you know and I think you know pitching wins ball games and helps you you know go all the way uh, Ryan, I have one more for you. So I know at one point when the team was struggling last year, John Mazalak talked about how they want to switch things up a little bit in terms of making sure that they are targeting pitchers with swing and miss. Well, you're good. You're good there. But do you think that there's anything from an organizational philosophical standpoint um, that the organization can do internally to try and boost that? versus obviously just looking for other pitchers that have more swing and miss stuff on the market or in trades. Yeah. You know, maybe that's something we need to do in spring training. You know, I feel like, you know, I remember being a younger guy, you want to come in and, you know, wow people and try to make the team. But I feel like we've got a few guys now who've been around and, you know, have some experience. This might be the time where we can work on stuff, like you said, to try to get more swing and miss and, you know, maybe change our, our, our pitching mindset a little bit and, you know, go for that. Um, I mean, you see, like I said, all the good bullpens have guys, there's seven, eight, nine guys that are striking out 25 to 35% of guys, you know, and, and that's what you need to miss bats and miss barrels when you're in the back, back into the bullpen. One more switching gears. AJ Prusinski is going to be pissed at me, but there, there's a tweet from you. I didn't want to let this go. Cause it's going to be dated if we get to you next time about it. Well, Ryan Helsley tweet. Can we just make it a 12 team playoff this year? Did we miss that? Cause we hadn't talked to you since. So you, you want to air it yeah. out for a sec? Yeah, I just I, I, I feel like it's tough. Only four teams, you know. I feel like majority of the people would agree with me in uh, in college football. I mean, I, you know, Georgia was the best team all year, and they lose to a great Alabama team. There's no reason they shouldn't be in it. And then you got Florida State, who's undefeated. You know, I, I couldn't imagine being on the Florida State team and not making the playoff. You know, facing all the adversity they faced, and still, you know, the name of the game is win, and they figured out ways to win. And you know. And I, I couldn't imagine being in those teams. And I'm a Ohio State fan, so I wanted them to be in it. You know, I thought they had a really good ball club, Marvin Harrison Jr. and those guys. And, um, you know, it'll be fun going forward seeing the new playoff format. I think it'll be better for the game and um, more meaningful games. You know, I don't think guys are going to sit out as much and, you know, if they're not making a playoff. And I think that's what fans want to see is the better players playing in, in those meaningful games. Yeah, Kratz, you can say it. Let's just let everybody in. Let's just let them all in. Like, <laughs> hey, did you guys have a quarterback? Did you guys? Are you guys hurt? Get your quarterback got hurt. We'll give you another one. Like, let everybody in. Ohio State, five hundred record. There. Yeah, but you can record. Six Ryan, wins a bowl game. Yeah, well, bowl games are stupid. But Ryan, you can tell them. You can complain on the fifth team because there's so many teams, right? Like, uh, they're on the outside looking in. They shouldn't have been. So you can't on the thirteenth. Like, no, you can't. Boise State isn't going to be pissed. 
James they Madison undefeated. University. If they went undefeated. They're going to be in that top twelve, right? Am I right? No. I barely watch any college. Yeah, college I mean, season. I think if you win the Power Five conference, you automatically get in, which is probably what it's going to be. You know, like how, how do you win a Power Five conference and not make the playoffs? That's that's my only thing. So then, so then everybody else, why are they even playing? Why don't they go make their own division? What do you mean everyone else? You just said, like, if, if you're not in a Power Five, then, and I'm really speaking then, out of my ass because I don't know what I'm talking about. But then you're not, then you're not in the playoff. No, go hey, on. Hey, Cardinals, hey, maybe, maybe we'll do that for the MLB too. Hey, uh, AL Central, NL Central, you're now one division, and you only get one representative in the playoff. Sorry, <laughs> you're not part of the Power Four divisions. <laughs> Who wins? Who does it? Who wins outside of the Power Five anyway? Nobody gets a shot. No one's deserved a yeah. shot. No one's. Well, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. South, South Dakota State or North Dakota State? <laughs> who just won? Give them. If you win the FBC, you get to no FCS. You get to go for the FBS. Yeah, sure. Pick well, that for, one. Whoever, whoever relegate. You should relegate. Oh. I think that that showed us Liberty was good, and then they played whoever it was in their bowl game, and Oregon. got smacked. They yeah. got killed. Yeah, I mean, well, there you go. The prime example of it. Prime example. That's why when Boise State played Alabama, they lost what sixty to seven or something like that. Like, I just sounded so smart about Oregon. Like, I actually cared or watched that game, but really, you know. it was one of the fans in the chat. Two seven five. That I see you. I'm calling myself out. Ryan, good talk, man. Keep doing your thing in the off season. We'll get you again in a few weeks. All right. All right, sounds good, y'all. Good to see y'all. Take care. You too. Appreciate you. Ryan Helsley with us. Uh, really timely, too, to have him when his buddy Jordan Hicks signs that contract. But, yeah, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But it's fun to play games for a couple minutes. That two minutes of college football that was brought to you by A.J. Przinski, who is not with us on the show today. He's not, yeah, he's not there. Monday. He's still here. Yeah, he is going to send me an angry text. Uh, let's slap hands. <laughs> All right, so clarification here, and we appreciate the super chat, Chris. Obviously, if anyone wants to throw a little love our way, we're always here for it. Got a lot of hard workers going on here on, on a daily basis. It, it all counts. Chris said, just wanted to clarify his comment from earlier when he was talking about the Yankees' payroll um, in relation to what the franchise value is. He said, I divided total payroll on spot track by franchise valuation, according to Forbes. Yankees are 30th. I get that. I, I get what Chris is saying on that front. So, um, and I think for team valuations, it's not all directly correlated to revenue. Like the Yankees are the Yankees. So you're going to probably, if they somehow went on the market crats, you're probably going to add a billy or two just based on the fact that who the hell ever gets to buy the Yankees, right? That is one of the most ultimate flexes on the planet if you're a billionaire. But, but I get what he's saying. And I agree. I've been on their case for the last couple of years where I'm like, they're up here, but they're not up here anymore. They, they don't swing around like they're at another level. They're, they're among the upper tier teams. I don't think they need to. I don't think they need to because of the stipulations that are out there. I'm not just going to go and just spend. I don't care if you're rich or poor. You're not just going to go and spend money because you can. You're going to spend money in the areas. And I think they've done a great job of building their farm system. Yes, we can have conversations about that different stuff, but not just don't just flex it uh, ignorantly. Don't just flex your money ignorantly because just because you have it. Like it shows. Look what happened to Mets last year. It's that's not the end all be all. Is to just spend the money. So they're never going to be that valuation is never going to equal it because their valuation is just going to continue to explode just add a couple billies to it yeah no big deal. easily the most iconic baseball uh brand i mean i've all these places to travel to people have new york hats on that that hat is iconic the i love new york shirt that, that slogan's iconic i mean their brand is worldwide i think uh you know the dodgers just expanded into obviously into asia but you go anywhere literally on the globe that yankee hat is prevalent then then honestly it's boston's Honestly, it's, well, the, the Dodgers now own, you know, baseball Japan. in Japan. I mean, how can yes. you not, right? That, that's well, well Godzilla that. still has something to say. Tanaka sure. has something to say. They, those two guys have something to say. Um, they're still Ichiro loyalists in Seattle. 
You still have those, but all those people now are 55, 60 years old. This whole new generation of baseball players, it is Yamamoto, Otani, um, Singa, yeah, and Yoshida. Yep. It is all those guys. And, um, you know, they're they're repping, and I love it. The third – when I played for the Yankees, the third – they were the third highest – it's not Q rating, but it's a long – because that's on a personal level. Is They have the largest reach – of any company or individual in America when they did an advertising type of reach research. It was whoever the president of the United States is at the time, Disney, and then the Yankees. Wow. Jeez. More than all of the other teams? More than football Like teams. McDonald's? That's impressive. More than football More teams. Than- McDonald's? A worldwide, <laughs> a worldwide reach. Hey, the Yankees have good food, too. I will give them that. They crush oh, it on, oh, on the yeah. spread. Not even just oh. for players, for fans. Like they, They've got it going on the food spectrum, really everywhere. Wh- wherever you're sitting, whatever kind of part of Yankee Stadium you're at. All right, i got to jump in a sec. So, Kratats, what do you got? <laughs> Perfect timing. Wow. Did they sign someone today? My ex-teammate. 2014 Buffalo Bison. I was either going to wear my Bison hat or my Yankees hat. Stroh Show coming to New York. His brand, his Ophos, whatever his shoe brand is called, this man is going to blow that brand up. And it is going – no better place to blow it up than in New York. That's going to – it's going to explode. And if there's a guy in baseball that can take advantage of it, this is the entrepreneur we need. Big time. And uh, Johnny in the chat, what time is Heyman coming on? Johnny, you missed it, but good news. You can rewind on YouTube and we'll <laughs> post it, obviously, either today or tomorrow on the podcast. Good reminder for everyone, too. We appreciate you. Smash the likes. I don't say this often, but we appreciate all of our fans. And also on the podcast, if you want to leave a rating or a review, that would be cool, too, to say what's up. Um, Adam, Eric, and AJ with us and me on Monday for MLK Day. Ron Washington's going to join us. We'll get another guest or two lined up. We'll get some big ones, all right? I'm pumped for Wash. So we'll see everyone Monday. Uh, Happy weekend. Ciao.